an electrochemical cell is the electrolytic cell. Now this is where you are using electrical energy to create a chemical reaction, to split an ionic compound into whatever its components are. So this time, instead of there being two separate containers, you only need one. And now we put into it the anode and the cathode. It's common to use this little symbol here to indicate which is which, where the longer line represents the positive electrode and the shorter line represents the negative electrode. Now the positive terminal here is the anode. Now hopefully you will have remembered that in the galvanic cell the anode was negative. In this it's changed its sign. Come back to that in a sec. The negative is called the cathode. And if I was to now use, say, let's, let's say we have in here some sodium chloride and we're going to put it molten. So I put an L there to indicate that I've melted the sodium chloride. Now you might say, why have you got to melt it? Well, remember, ionic compounds have ions which are very, very strongly held together by ionic bonds. If you want those ions to move, and unless they move, you're not going to get anything happening, then you need to either break the bonds using heat, like melting, or you can dissolve it in water. And I'll come on to the dissolving in water one in just a moment. So what would happen here? Well, the sodium ions obviously are going to travel to the negative electrode, the cathode. So sodium ions will gain electrons at the cathode and become sodium metal. Chloride ions will travel to the anode. Chloride will then turn into chlorine atoms by giving up electrons. And then two chlorine atoms become chlorine gas. So what you would see is chlorine gas forming at the anode and sodium metal forming at the cathode. Again, even though these have changed signs, the anode is now positive, the cathode is negative, at the anode we are still seeing oxidation taking place, electrons being lost. At the cathode, reduction is still taking place, electrons are gained. So even though the sign of the electrodes change, when you go from a galvanic cell to an electrolytic, the definitions of anode and cathode never change. By definition, the anode is always where oxidation takes place, and the cathode is always where reduction takes place. So that's for a molten, uh, a molten compound. What would happen if you now change this into aqueous? Well, unfortunately, we're now adding something else. As well as those ions there, we're going to be adding H plus and OH minus ions from water. Now, that is indicating that this doesn't happen very easily. There will be very, very few of those ions present, but you cannot ignore them. In fact, at the cathode, where sodium ions and hydrogen ions will now travel, there will be a competition. And whichever ion is easier to discharge, will discharge. Now if you look at the list of electropotentials, you will see that sodium is right up the top and has a value of minus 2.71 volts, whereas hydrogen is zero. Now 2.7 volts may not sound like a lot, but it is a huge amount of energy. And what that means is, in practice, this cannot discharge. This will discharge. So now at the cathode, hydrogen gas will be produced. At the anode, there will be hydroxide ions and chloride ions. Again, if you look at the electrochemical series and the electropotentials, you will find that chlorine is going to be, chlorine is down here, and that's 1.36. And a little bit further up is the hydroxide ion, 0.4. So a difference of under a volt. What that means is, 
that the hydroxide and the chloride may both discharge depending on conditions. So if I had a dilute aqueous solution of sodium chloride, dilute solution, so the chloride ion concentration isn't very high, then hydroxide ions are the one that discharge. They will become oxygen gas and oxygen will be produced at the anode. However, if you now make the sodium chloride solution concentrated and up the value of the chloride ion, now that extra number of chloride ions can swing the balance in its favour. So if it's concentrated, chloride becomes chlorine, just like it did in the molten salt. Okay? Now the syllabus requires you to distinguish between those two. If it's molten, it's easy. There's only two ions present. But if it's aqueous, you've got to remember the hydrogen and hydroxide ions will compete. If they're competing with sodium, hydrogen will win every time because sodium ions are so, so difficult to discharge. But hydroxide and chloride, hydroxide are easier, but not that much easier. So hydroxide will discharge in dilute aqueous solution and chlorine will be then produced in concentrated aqueous solution. There's one other one that the syllabus requires you to know, and that is copper sulfate. This time as a solution. So if I put copper sulfate in there, CuSO4, then what I've got obviously is copper sulfate will turn into copper ions and sulfate ions. SO4, 2 minus. Okay, so at the cathode, we now have a competition between hydrogen ions and copper ions. Hydrogen ions, we've already said, is zero. Copper ions are plus 0.34. That means it's easier for copper ions to discharge. So if I do an ele electrolysis of copper sulfate, copper metal is produced at the cathode. At the anode, hydroxide ions and sulfur sulfate ions will both travel there. Now sulfate doesn't appear in your electrochemical series chart. The best advice I can give to you is then ignore it. And in other words, when copper sulfate is electrolyzed, oxygen is produced from the hydroxide ion. Sulfate ions, they are in a chart, but there's a, it's a much more detailed chart. They're incredibly difficult to discharge. Again, as I say, the fact that they don't appear at all is all you need to worry about.